Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Pons, Pons Pandikuthira. I had uh, product planning and advanced strategy at Nissan in Europe. And I'd like to share with you a vision for an intelligent mobility future. Some interesting ideas, and hopefully that inspires some young and creative minds in the audience and those watching. I think it's fair to say that mobility today is just not intelligent. If you had to look at this by the numbers, for example, we use internal combustion engines for the most part to move us around. They're at best 30% efficient. We have accepted 70% inefficiency for a very long time. 1.25 million people die every year in car accidents. 80 to 90% of those are caused by human error. We build 80 million cars every year to be sold all over the planet. By the way, there's excess capacity to build almost 110 or 120 million. So you can imagine when companies figure out a way to put that additional capacity on the planet, what that's going to look like. And by the way, those vehicles have only a 10% at best utilization rate. They spend 90% of their time sitting parked. So I'd say that's certainly, certainly less than intelligent. There's congestion, there's pollution, there's high inefficiency in powertrains, there's inefficiency in usage. But before all of you think that this is now going to be a presentation about a, a, a numb future with electric pods moving us around, let me show you this slide really quick. So that's a picture of me with my favorite uh, high-speed toy. It's a 550 horsepower Nissan GTR. That picture was taken at the German Black Forest. I'd like to draw your attention to the picture on the right half of your screen. And the top left of that picture is a number, 307. So that was me doing 307 kilometers per hour. And the, the number on the top right, 64.5, that's liters per 100 kilometers. The absolutely ludicrous consumption while I was doing that speed. So those of you in the audience, my wife included, probably thinking that's not really very intelligent. <laughs> well, the reason I show this slide is I like to say that the, the vision for the future comes from a place that has a lot of passion for cars, passion for speed, and passion for improving what this is in the future. In fact, all of us are sitting on a planet that's rotating at 1,600 kilometers per hour, quite peacefully. The planet does that speed emission-free without hitting into anything. So high speeds are not the problem. It's hitting into stuff. That's the problem. But more on that in the future. So a wise man, Bill Gates, let me read his quote. We always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. So change is inevitable. However, the pace of change is unpredictable. So let's look at some macro trends, some changes across the planet that are going to change the way we move in the future. By the year 2020, 42% of the planet's population will be considered middle class. Middle class adjusted for purchasing power parity in their respective markets. In countries like uh, China, India, and Brazil, that number is actually closer to 60 to 70%. And typically, middle-class populations have bought cars to move their families around for comfort and convenience, but also as a symbol of status. What is that going to do to the roads of the future when all of these people buy vehicles and put them on the infrastructure that's draining today? Now, by the way, remember that over 90% of the time that these cars are on the road, they're actually idle and uh, not very productive. This massive growth in the middle class is also accompanied by another interesting trend, which is migration to urban areas. Urban areas which are mega cities like Shanghai, mega regions like Moscow and the surrounding region, or mega corridors like that in the US Northeast. These areas are going to be the population that lives in these areas will increase by 50%, using 2010 as the baseline, and by 2025, that would move up by 50%. Already in the year 2016, the planet crossed the 50% threshold, where more than 50% of us now live in urban areas rather than the rural areas that they used to be in. With this migration, cities will drive the creation of wealth, cities will gain in power and influence across the planet. In fact, that's already happening. If you look at this slide, it's a chart of the GDP stacked by countries, and look at where the city of London lands. 
right on par with Saudi Arabia, oil-rich Saudi Arabia and the city of London match each other in terms of GDP. So cities will be extremely powerful. Take a look at some other numbers. Paris already contributes 23% to the French economy. Istanbul, 28% of Turkey's economy. And Madrid, 25% of Spain's economy. So the city will need to be treated as a customer of the future. They will define the wants and needs of the end user and the consumer that we're actually trying to target. In fact, they will set the standards that we will have to comply by. They will gain an influence, and they're going to demand smart solutions. Smart solutions to solve their mobility needs, the transportation needs, the renewable and sustainable level of how these additional vehicles and people can be moved, ar moved across their cities. Now, many cities are already embracing this and are shifting the paradigm. You see major cities across Europe, actually Europe is on the leading edge of this, that have car and bike sharing solutions, dedicated lanes for electric vehicles. They're growing the uh, EV charging infrastructure. They have taxes and bans on high polluting vehicles. So this is already starting. This next animation really puts this in perspective. So take a look at this. This is 200 people in roughly 177 cars. What if we took the cars away? What if we put them on bikes? What if we put them on three buses? Or best yet, what if we put them on one light commuter train? Look at what that does to reduce massively the level of congestion in a city. Now, congestion isn't the only problem. Safety is a massive problem. Did you know that 1.25 people die every year in traffic-related accidents? Every year. 80 to 90% of those accidents are fully avoidable because they're caused by human error. In Europe alone, 85,000 people die every single year. Can you imagine if 85,000 people died in plane crashes in Europe every year? Imagine the chaos that would, that would create and would galvanize us to action to change something. Why should we be any less excited about changing fundamentally how we move people around? So autonomous driving in the future will make our vehicles significantly safer. The technology is not very mature just yet, but the progress being made is stunning. The pace at which it's growing is absolutely stunning. The vehicle you see on the screen behind me is a Nissan Leaf. We just tested this vehicle two months ago. We demonstrated it to journalists outside London driving fully autonomously, highway conditions, urban conditions, roundabouts, you name it. This was a test and prototype vehicle. In fact, this year, we will launch a Nissan Leaf and a Nissan Qashqai on public European roads that will be fully autonomous on one lane on the highway. And next year, they will be able to handle multiple lanes. And soon after that, the date isn't set as yet, we will have vehicles that can handle even urban conditions. The future, in fact, the autonomous driving vehicles of the future will collect data both from infrastructure and from other vehicles to significantly change how they interact with one another and make driving on the road significantly safer. And who knows, maybe the future of Formula One could be an autonomous future. Maybe the racing cars of the future are driverless, fully autonomous vehicles developed by a team of highly sophisticated engineers who all share the glory of winning a championship instead of a single race car driver. And maybe the companies that, that back this kind of effort can invest the money in the technology required for autonomous driving and then bring that technology down into passenger cars of the future. Brands could truly use this to showcase what they're capable of and differentiate themselves from one another. Now, for autonomous driving to be seriously effective, we need to have a high level of connectivity. We need all the vehicles on this planet to be connected to the cloud and connected to one another and seamlessly transfer data from one to another. This is going to require zero latency rates. That doesn't exist with the technology we have today. However, 5G is that game changer. By the year 2020, 5G connectivity will be available widely across most of Europe, most of the developed world, making rapid progress through the developing markets. 5G will allow this level of zero latency and allow a high level of connectivity between cars. The future of autonomous driving is going to require massive amounts of data to be transferred from the vehicle to the cloud, cloud to the vehicle, and from vehicle to vehicle. 
Augmented reality and virtual reality projections need to be sent to vehicles. 5G will allow all of this. It will really be the, uh, the enabler that changes the rate at which autonomous driving will become mainstream. Remember what I said earlier, speed isn't the problem. It's hitting stuff that's the problem. An autonomous vehicle communicating with other vehicles on the road will completely eliminate this issue. Now, along with autonomous driving and the intelligence that goes into defining those cars, we need a smarter way to propel our vehicles. We cannot accept 70% inefficiency for the foreseeable future. Electrification will become mainstream. We will see that in more and more vehicles across the world. Electric vehicles were once the realm of quirky inventors or the very rich, and now they're becoming mainstream. In fact, the Renault-Nissan Alliance has sold 500,000 vehicles, slightly less than 500,000 vehicles worldwide today. And these aren't vehicles sold for, uh, to those people who can afford exclusive country clubs. They're to average, everyday people who are using these cars to commute to their jobs. Electrification is not just a fad, it will be a thing for the future and the long term, and these are the five key trends that are driving electrification. Government regulations, more EVs being built, charging infrastructure that's growing, local tax incentives, of course, and the declining reputation of diesel as a way of propelling people around. So the question I get asked a lot is, how is this EV volume going to grow over time? Today, in 2017, we sell 100,000 EVs. By 2020, just by virtue of those companies building more EVs, we will sell about 300,000 worldwide, all car companies included. But by 2025, this number is going to grow dramatically. These are four different projections that you see on the top. Two of them are projections by databases, LMCA and Bloomberg. What you see is this, that is the NOR projection, is the Norway projection. What if all countries in Europe adopted the same level of leadership that Norway has with electric vehicles? How many electric vehicles would we have? And the last one is COP21. If everybody who made COP21 commitments actually did what they said they would do, we would sell 2.6 million. If we just did a simple average across all of this, that's 2 million EVs in 2025, 2 million real EVs on the road. Now, if all of these changes come in the automotive industry, we need to look at the industry and the environment differently in order to value it correctly and put the right level of investment into this technology. Today's industry is very traditional, 80 million cars, an average of $20,000 per car. That's a 1.6 trillion industry. If, on the other hand, you took a more contemporary view, number of vehicles on the planet, how many miles they do on average per year, and a simple revenue of $1 per mile, that is now a $10 trillion industry. What if we look at it slightly differently? As we drive autonomously, you will be immensely more productive inside of a car. That's time that can be used to consume data, generate data, consume media, think the possibility of shopping and delivery while you're in your car. So the number of hours spent in a vehicle, whatever type of vehicle it may be, can be extremely valuable. How can we quantify that? What if we took 10 trillion, 10 trillion miles done per year at an average low speed of 25 miles per hour? That's 400 billion hours. And if you put a simple price tag of $10 per hour, that's another $4 trillion industry. And remember what I showed you earlier, just selling cars today is only 1.6 trillion. So the way we look at valuing the industry and investing in its future should be dramatically different in the future. With all of these changes that I've just outlined, Mobility in the future will look like a fully integrated platform. That it has all of these stakeholders that you see listed behind you. The participants will be more than just car companies, but will look more like this. An array of suppliers from OEMs, original equipment manufacturers, rental companies, public transport, software companies, parking companies, etc., that will seamlessly provide an intelligent and efficient way to move people around this planet. That was just scratching the surface, scratching the surface of what intelligent mobility would be and should be. What I'd also like to show you is what it should never be in the future. This picture is from a real traffic jam in April 2010 in the Beijing area. It lasted for 10 days and 100 kilometers. This is a very real occurrence. Our future should never never look like this. And I really hope that the young and creative minds start to look at the automotive industry differently, that we attract the creative and innovative talent to help solve these problems, instead of looking at it as the slightly lackluster, less than cutting-edge innovation industry that it has been. 
I'd like to leave you with Nissan's vision, that's vision today, of what this future should look like. For one, it should be a zero emission future. Take a look at this relatively trendy home. It's powered by solar power. It collects energy during the day, and it stores it in that very cool looking box that you see on the wall. That little blue box is made by Nissan and Eaton today. It's called X Storage. It's made from used electric vehicle batteries, and in some cases, even new batteries if somebody wants higher capacity. So it stores the energy so you can plug in your car at night and then use the energy from it to have a completely renewable source and zero emission propulsion of your vehicle. And remember, I told you, I do like driving fast. We do need to have fun toys to drive on the German Autobahn. So what would a car of the future look like? So what you see here is a picture. It's a concept car from Nissan. It's a prototype called the Nissan Blade Glider, a fully functional prototype. It has a narrower footprint. It's triangular in shape. It has seating for three people, not the traditional four. It's a high-speed vehicle, fully electric, fully connected, able to detect other vehicles in its environment, able to get 5G inputs of data as well as media that could be sent directly to the vehicle. And this way, I think we can cleverly move people around the planet, have fun, and still be extremely environmentally responsible. This is our vision today. This is our vision of the future today. But I think by 2025, we will truly, like Bill Gates said, have underestimated the level of change and will have a glorious, glorious future of uh, automotive intelligent mobility. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>